Coming up, we'll be discussing part one of Big Finish Productions' massive new release, The Legacy of Time. And we also asked you, dear listeners, what you thought of it. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Legacy of Time. I don't believe it. Ah, there you are. What kept you? Cocktails? Ah, this should be interesting. Doctor! Hey, Doctor! Doctor. Who are these strange shouting women? Archaeologists. (laughs) Brilliant. When can we have an adventure? It's already started. Ah! Whoa, Alison, good work! We've had a bit more experience since the last time you met us. We can handle ourselves these days. I can tell. You must have activated his jet pack. It'll take him time to get it under control. I need to link the holes and then pass physically through the breach you arrived through. That sounds too simple. No, it's simple enough. I'll have a couple of men help set up a... Jake, watch out! No, Joe! Get back! No, 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 no! appear like that before. Not when you have. I need to get your ship on the same wavelength as mine. Do you mind? I'm Jenny. Did I say that already? Hello, Jenny. I'm the Doctor. What? What? What is happening out there? Things live in the vortex. Vortisaurs. And no, they're usually much warier. I suggest you call a halt to abandoning ship. The multi-haven and cybermen in Singapore. I'm in the eye of the storm. <sighs> the time storm. Wish me luck! Good luck! You're not from 1751. You have no right to be here either. Release your prisoner and leave. You think you can threaten us? Oh, yes. You're outnumbered. And outgunned. But surely she cannot be the doctor? Listen, the next time you need a favour, ask someone else. I have no idea who you are, and I haven't asked you to do anything. Time travel. Does my head in. Come on, we haven't got all day. Navigational coordinates reprogrammed. Dimensional stabilizers engaged. Ezra buffers online. We're clear for vortex access. Power levels at maximum. Force fields up. Dematerialize. No. Dematerializing. Big finish. We love stories. Hi everyone, welcome back to the CB podcast. Today we're talking exclusively about the first episode of The Legacy of Time. Um, it's called Lies and Ruins, and it's been written by James Goss. And he's written a lot of Doctor Who, too much to mention in this podcast, but most recently he co-penned Scratch Man with Tom Baker. Didn't he, Lane? Uh, yes, yes, he did, yeah. And we reviewed that not so long ago on the podcast, mm-hmm. if you want to check that out. Um, so what did you think of the story, Liam? Well, on the whole, I thought it was uh, really rather good. I mean, it was it's tremendously exciting because um, the main reason why we have this absolutely epic adventure is because Big Finish Audio or Big Finish Productions is celebrating 20 years of doing Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. So uh, so they've got the, uh, the six-episode epic, which is this huge story which um, brings in pretty much all the characters that they can from from the TV series and from obviously the Big Finish audio adventures and Big Finish very kindly released the very first episode which as you said is called Lies and Ruins um, free for people to listen to as a sort of uh, a teaser trailer for the rest of rest of the story um, a full episode so it wasn't just you know here's a 10 minute uh, section here's a full episode for you to listen to which I thought was very generous and it was tremendously exciting to listen to yeah, and given that it's um, leading on from the past twenty years, a big finish. It's very accessible to uh, to jump in and listen to, isn't it? Yes, very much so. I mean, because um, there's, I mean, you got into big finish pretty early on, whereas I've only dipped in and out of it a little bit over the years. In fact, probably I've only listened to a handful of stories. Um, I mean, we've touched upon this in a previous podcast, but basically because we were about 11 years old when Big Finish launched in 1999, or I think it was a bit earlier. But when they you're, did... making, you're making them feel old. <laughs> I'm making me feel old. Um, so we were like 11 in 1999, and uh, with The Sirens of Time, which was the very first release, and then they you know, quickly picked up the pace and released more as the years went on. And I think you got in pretty early on to discover Big Finish, whereas um, I was more focused on the BBC books. 
Mm. Um, and then as, as time went on, it was sort of because the, they are absolutely prolific in the amount of adventures that they've released. It got a bit daunting of going, well, where on earth, where on earth do I begin? So I've listened to a couple. I think I've listened to, Mid um, I think it's called Midnight Chimes. No, that's not right. It's the Eighth Doctor one. Yeah, the Chimes of Midnight. The Chimes yeah. of Midnight. I was nearly there. Yeah, the Chimes of Midnight, which I think was really good. Because BBC Radio broadcast that, uh, broadcast that. And I've listened to Master and there's a couple of others. Um, <clears throat> and it's been quite good uh, for the sake of this podcast. Um, just using an excuse to, to finally you know throw myself into Big Finish. But beca So because I don't have that much knowledge of of Big Finish Doctor Who adventures... And this is celebrating it. Yeah, I didn't feel that like I I didn't feel I was lost at all. Um, listening to Lies and Ruins, it uh, it was accessible. It was very um, easy to get into. There's a couple of, there's a couple of points which I'll raise later on. I mean, I was a little bit confused with the with the companion rear, um, because I thought, oh, is this is this a companion that I'm, that I'm not aware of? But as the episode goes on and what's actually revealed about Rhea um, she's a companion which is just introduced in this episode yeah she was a curious one um, especially when we thought she was a real person <laughs> so it was a strange character wasn't it mm -hmm. um, I think this story was probably quite accessible to um, a lot of the TV viewers because of course we've got this whole story from River's perspective as well um, you don't have to be um, fluent in all the Bernie Summerfield stories to follow this, do you? No, no. I mean, once again, because uh, Big Finish have done Lisa um, uh, Lisa Bowman and Big Finish have been doing Bernie Summerfield adventures uh, pretty much from the beginning. Again, an overwhelming amount of stories. <laughs> if you want to jump in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, I was I was aware of Bernie Summerfield from from having read some of the Virgin New Adventure books because that was a mm. companion that was introduced there. Um, brilliant companion and but yeah you you can listen to this and it, it sort of explains who B Bernice Summerfield is uh, just through the through the way that um, she and River relate and it's if you're aware of the two characters because they're both archaeologists from the future mm -hmm. who are companions of the Doctor it makes sense that you would have Bern, uh, Bernice and River uh, meet what I quite liked, uh, I mean, I don't know whether this has been explored in, in, in previous uh, audio adventures, but what, one thing I did like when listening to this was that it's actually explained that Bernice Summerfield actually taught River Song. Mm. Well, the matter of having River and Benny being associates somehow didn't feel forced, I thought. And, um, and it finally made the scene in Series 7's Let's Kill Hitler feel more relevant um, in that particular episode. After River gives up all her remaining regenerations to heal the Eleventh Doctor, um, she's enrolled in the Lunar University, um, and we see um, there's a professor that she's talking to, mm -hmm. and in fact that character is from a Virgin story called Continuity Errors by Stephen Moffat, um, and he's called Professor Arthur Candy, and he also appears in Oh No It Isn't by Paul Cornell alongside Benny. Ah, uh, right, okay. And this character is both in print and audio versions. So he's been a big finish. Mm -hmm. um, so now it becomes clear that the, that the scene in Let's Kill Hitler was, in fact, showing River and Roland there to study archaeology only to meet Bernie Summerfield. Ah, right, okay. Oh, well, th that, that nicely ties everything in. I hadn't, yeah. uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't clocked that. All right, okay, well, that's good. So it's it's been sort of um, established previously, although not... Not intentionally, possibly. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, as you said uh, before, it 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 didn't feel forced. It just felt natural. Not at all, no. Uh, with the way that it was explained in in this episode, um, I mean, I've always liked the the character of Bernice, and actually hearing Lisa Bauman perform that character, she plays the part really, really well, and is very charming and very likable. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always liked Alex Kingston as an actress, and she plays River very well. What was interesting, though, was pairing those two people off. Um, it, it did make me realise that something about River, which I suppose has always been there in the TV episode, but it's, it's really flagged up here, is how actually 
and it can be a bit irritating is actually how smug she is. Yes. You were mentioning that there's been comparisons between the two because they're both companions of the Doctor, both professors of archaeology. But it's not until you pair them up that you start to see the differences. Yes, yeah, yeah. But yeah, she is rather smug. <laughs> But again, it was it was it was nice because we've got um, so we've got the, those two and the contrast between uh, Bernice and River and how they relate, and then uh, Paul McGann's Doctor, the Eighth Doctor, uh, comes along, uh, accompanied with this new companion Rhea, who's quite childish, overexcited, annoying. Uh, would you say? Well, that's the thing. It was sort of <clears throat> she, she. I think. Um, it was quite innocent. Very, yeah, very innocent, and I think it 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 just skirted around the issue, maybe being a bit irritating. I, I mean, actually, I thought she was quite quite likable, uh, and was a good contrast to uh, to the other characters. Um, and it, but it's quite funny how Bernice and River <laughs> react to her. That's that that's quite funny. But one of the things that I thought was it was really touching was even though that, that they find her quite irritating, um, when they're in trouble later on in the episode and uh, Rhea has has been hit, hit and uh, quite severely injured and the, the, the dragging her along with them, you know she's going you know leave me. One of the things that I quite liked was to go no, but you're you, you're part of the team, um, you know that it was sort of that thing of you're a friend of the doctor, so therefore you're a friend of ours, which I thought which I thought was really nice. Like a family, yeah. Yeah. To my recollection, this will be the third time that Bernice has met the Eighth Doctor. The first being The Dying Days by Lance Parkin. Mm-hmm. You know you know that, The Virgin Adventure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and The Dying Days is most known for being the final licensed Who book from Virgin Publications. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and it's also one of the most sought after Doctor Who books. Because of its limited availability. Yeah, it is jolly expensive. <laughs> I've been trying to get my hands on it for a while, but with the extortionate prices that are being sold. Although, it is considerably cheaper than if you wanted to buy uh, the Season t- uh, season 12 Blu-ray box set. Ah, so if you can't quite afford, if you can't afford the Season 12 box set. Yeah, which some people are selling on eBay for £600. Which is... Just set- settle for the dying days. Settle for the dying days. It's... Uh... <laughs> It's like a poor man's season twelve. <laughs> yes. Um, and the, the second time Bernice has met the Doctor um, in audio, it would be the Company of Friends, and that's an Eighth Doctor series of short stories where the Doctor meets different people, mm-hmm. and one of them is um, his encounter with Benny, which is the first time the actors um, have appeared together. Ah, right, okay. In fact, uh, talking about that, because um, as this uh, episode uh, progressed and they realised that they are on Gallifrey and uh, the Doctor then has to defend it against um, uh, planet scavengers and the way that he sort of behaves, um, as that progressed... I wasn't entirely sure. I, I wasn't particularly keen on this element of the Eighth Doctor's character, if I'm honest. It didn't feel like. Mm-hmm. I mean, because uh, again, I suppose it goes to, to to my knowledge of you know because with the Eighth Doctor, I'm aware of him through um, through obviously the TV movie, um, the Eighth Doctor Adventure books, and some early, not an awful lot, but some of the early Big Finish uh, audio adventures. I've missed the ones where he is, you know, the, the time war is actually going on, but he's trying mm-hmm. to keep a distance from it all. And this this is obviously something that's played on in the episode where Bernice in particular is quite shocked at how um, how damn beat the Eighth Doctor suddenly is. It's because of, you know, because of the time war. Um, so th- one question I wanted to ask you is, um, with the way that the Eighth Doctor is portrayed in this episode, because you've listened to an awful lot and you've listened to the Dark Eye series and, and, and so on. Um, did this feel like a, a, a logical progression from, from, from those? It did. He's come such a long way. Uh, he's certainly um, in a state of conflict inside. Mm-hmm. And he's come a, a long way since the TV movie. Um, now, you did mention Dark Eyes. 
and that was kind of the beginning of a new epoch in the the eighth doctor's life you know he's um he's he's been through a hell of a lot he's lost a lot um but even at that stage he's reluctant um to get involved he says um if there's a war he's not going to fight um but obviously it gets to the point in this story where perhaps Reverend Benny have persuaded him to take part uh, but maybe in a different way a less involved way but I do feel it does feel like a natural progression in his story arc ah right okay so suppose I mean I suppose that's one thing that uh, was a little bit lost on me and it, it did come as a as a complete uh, shock mm-hmm. of going oh right okay th- this is how the Earth Doctor is I, I uh, no, it's consistent with how he is now. It's a million miles away from how he was in the early audios, though. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a good thing. Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. You definitely want uh, character development. I was I was just wondering if that does actually gel um, with with the adventures that, you be, that, you, that you've listened to. But I'll write yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I think it does, 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty early on, we learn that the Doctor doesn't really know um, who Bernice and River are. And you can... You can hear the disappointment in River's voice, particularly. Mm-hmm. And Benny seems a little bit shocked. But she doesn't seem to follow up on that, does she? She just kind of shrugs it off. Yeah, I mean, but I, th- I think the the reason for that is because um, it's it's a, you know, th- that is during their, uh, when they they first met. But then later on, it is... Um, it is... Uh, the Doctor does say that he actually, he does remember her. And with regards to how River's behaving here, mm-hmm. um, I feel it helps helps us realise where this is for River and her timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, when Benny and River are in the next valley checking out the Vogan ruins, River whips out her Sonic. So this would place this story in between the Husbands of River song and Silence in the Library. No, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a sonic screwdriver, was it? I think it was a sonic trowel. Ah, okay. Just if this had been a very late river, this might explain her disappointment when she realised that the eighth Doctor didn't know who she was because she had a similar reaction with the tenth Doctor. Yes, that does that does make sense actually. Yeah. So yeah, mm. yeah. I think I think you're probably right. Possibly. Mm. When river, well, another theory here. Um, when River is asked, does she love all the Doctors by Bernice, mm-hmm. even the grumpy old one, <laughs> to which he replies, which one? This could be further confirmation that it's set after Husband's River song, because she's met, if if Capaldi's the grumpy old one. Yeah, that's true. But obviously, it's. I think there's a, there's a nice hint that at some point she's even met the first Doctor. Well, yes, but when he, she says which one, I thought she was... I thought she was met, she was saying which one the first or the twelfth. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. no, no yeah. <laughs> and of course, um, Bernice explains to River that she's met the eighth Doctor before, but he was different. Now he seems so tired, and River River responds with, um, "This one lives a long life, um, not all of it plain sailing." Mm-hmm. So this could be a reference to the the eighth Doctor having a massive shed load of adventures. Um, during which he's actually lived for hundreds of years. Um, of course, I might be wrong on this, but I, there was a stage where the Eighth Doctor had had more adventures than many of the other Doctors. No, I think you're right because he he probably has because when you think about it, you know you've got um, you've got all the books, all the which comics. is yep. Yeah, so you've got the Telos novellas; they were mini stories. We've got the Big Finish short stories in print. We've got BBC books. We've got the Virgin New Adventure, yeah, and in print, yeah, and what else? Uh, and then obviously the the main the main uh, BBC books, and then you've got uh, the comics in general, and then you've got um, and then you've got all the big Finnish audio adventures. Mm-hmm. So even the books in print, I'm pretty sure there was about seventy plus uh, BBC books for the Eighth Doctor. I think so. That sounds about right. Yeah, that's quite a lot, isn't it, compared to the past Doctor adventures that there were probably releasing mm-hmm. so if anyone knows how many adventures the eighth doctors had in relation to the other doctors just let us know that'd be interesting to know yeah i'd be curious to see how uh 
how many, well, how many he's done in total and how that compares with the other Doctors, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the Doctor desi- designed his new companion, Rhea. Mm-hmm. Um, is, do you think, to the Doctor, Rhea is the ideal companion if he designed her? Uh, and did he program her to hurt her ankle? <laughs> he's just like I've hurt my ankle and he's like no you've just been disintegrated <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that was a, uh, well I don't think he's necessarily designed uh, the perfect companion I think what he's d- the way that I read it was um, he'd designed the companion that he needed to that he needed at that precise moment because He's going through a really difficult time, and there's a lot of you know serious issues with the time war. And as you said earlier, you know he's lost an awful lot. So I think yeah. what what he needed was a complete contrast to that, which is just someone who is just bubbly and innocent. Yeah, and he also shows well. a lot a lot of compassion for her. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not that means she's like sentient from our point of view, um, but. The Doctor's always showed a lot of compassion towards robot life, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he has. But um, I thought, I thought that scene was actually really, uh, really well played out because up until that point, um, there was no hint that she was actually a robot uh, or an android or whatever. Um, so you you just think that this is this is a companion and a hitherto undiscovered companion of the Doctor who's who's dying. And I was almost on the verge of tears. I thought it was. I thought it was very well written, very well uh, performed. It was yeah, an, a nice uh, emotional, dramatic scene. And of course, it, you know, there's that realization that this was a, a companion that um, that the Doctor designed and was robotic, which was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought that was a that was a nice emotional scene. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting that Rhea was um, able to control the the so called Matrix power. Mm-hmm. When she, whenever, when River and Benny were um, getting it, well, Benny more specifically, but um, they were getting overwhelmed by um, this remnant of the Matrix, or so the thought. That's what it was. And then Rhea comes in, and her her positivity is bounced back, is um, thrown back in her face. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, well, during that whole that whole moment, because that's set in the uh, the. Uh, the tower of the tomb of rassilon yeah i thought it was a, it was a, it was a nice touch that they used the music for, uh, a little bit of music from the five doctors yes it's i think it's interesting that we hear the music does this imply that the music was definitely being heard and not just incidental music well, that's what in I... the five doctors yeah. <laughs> so where they were it was just this definite cacophony of the bbc radiophonic <laughs> workshop that everyone just uh, we'll just but we'll we we'll, we'll won't acknowledge it but yeah we can hear it um, but I thought I thought it was a nice touch, although I do think they overplayed it a little bit. If, if possibly, I, if I was to be a little bit overly critical, but it was a, but it was a nice touch. It helped with the whole visual element to it because we we could picture the scene a bit better, couldn't we? Yes, that, that, that's true. Because initially, um, to begin with, we're not entirely sure where where we are. Um, just all of a sudden, we're on this planet where there's there's just. A huge plethora of um, of archaeological discoveries uh, and tombs and so on. Um, mm. But yeah, then they come across uh, some language which can't be deciphered. I mean, I did think, oh, maybe mm. it is Gallifreyan, and it turned out it was. And then the way that Rhea had described this huge sort of gothic tower, I went, oh, I wonder if it looks like the tomb of Rassilon. And it turned out, well, yes, it is uh, mm. because it's uh, it's on Gallifrey. Um, I was going to come to a point I completely forgot what it was I'm rambling too much something about the dog tower <laughs> it's the music no. I forgot what it was now well this is a fantastic podcast I completely forgot anyway let's 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 move on jeez <laughs> um, it's great so the doctor is supposedly on the dog tower mm-hmm. um, and he shows no mercy to the scavengers does he so clearly he's not the man he used to be no, no, definitely not. Because that, that's what I was talking about before. When when he starts um, defending Gallifrey, and as you say, he's he's not particularly merciful with the way that he's no. dealing with the scavengers. Uh, no. And I thought it was uh, I thought it was uh, certainly performed very well. But for, as I said 
earlier from from my point of view it was just oh the, the, this isn't this is not the eighth doctor uh, that i know i mean i went with the story and i think that the way that everything was um <coughs> was resolved uh and and was handled i thought was was dealt with very well but as you mm-hmm. say it's um if you're much more ad- if you're much more aware of the Big Finish Shorty Avengers and the character progression that the Eighth Doctor has done in the, 20, you know, during these twenty years, yeah. um, it um, it does work. Oh yes, um, and of course, Bernice questions his um, his actions, doesn't he? Because the Doctor's u- using this power to protect Gallifrey. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think he's defending it out of his own guilt for not having saved it? Possibly. Possibly, but I mean, at, at that point in his timeline, he's not he's not aware of that. No, but uh, he probably probably feels that he could have done more. Um, like he's failed, he's failed the future of Gallifrey. Um, but it's interesting that he throws the scavengers' firing beams back at them, mm-hmm. and he and he's he. Um, well, when Benny arrives, she's shocked by his actions, mm-hmm. and she says that maybe the Matrix is affecting him. Which I thought at the time I thought oh, possibly, but it turns out it wasn't. Um, possibly. No, 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 it wasn't. But uh, the, the way that um, I took that, I didn't think I didn't think uh, Bernice was being literal. I think she was just maybe trying to find a get out clause mm-hmm. because you know, obviously, you know, she describes the Doctor as her uh, as her best friend, someone that obviously she's very <clears throat> that she's very close to. And then seeing this complete character change would throw you. So the way that I saw that was she's just trying to find an excuse, but even she isn't totally sold on it. No, maybe it's just wishful thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course she tries to rationalise with him. Um, and she gets him to say out loud what he's doing. Um, you know, like that he's killing them. And mm-hmm. that's when he comes to the realisation that perhaps what he's doing is wrong. Yeah. That perhaps he wasn't admitting it to himself. Um, when they're looking down, admiring the, the beauty of Gallifrey beneath them, um, River says, you've taken me to so many places, but you've never brought me home. And the Doctor doesn't seem to click, does he? Mm. No, no, he doesn't. What, what, he's, what she's directly saying. Mm-hmm. He's just like, oh, have now? Sorry. <laughs> because, of course, she thinks she's re- referring to Gallifrey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. River um, finally figures it all out, doesn't she? That the planet they're standing on isn't Gallifrey. Mm-hmm. Um, I love how she directs the question into Bernice, like hushing the Doctor. <laughs> um, but she's questioning whether the Matrix is capable of doing all this. And she's asking, is there a piece of Gallifrey in tech that could? Um, did you start to click on that perhaps it was a TARDIS? At that, uh, yeah, at that point, I thought that was it was obvious that was the direction it was going in. What I wasn't entirely sure was: is it just a TARDIS in general, or is it, or maybe it's the Doctor's TARDIS in the far future? Mm-hmm. I Obviously, mean, it's da- too early to guess, but yeah, um, but yeah whose could it be? Mm-hmm. He, the Doctor does say it could be an experimental model. Yes, yeah, he does say that, yeah. Shortly after this, they go back to see Rhea, and the Doctor seems to have compassion for her, like I mentioned before. Mm. Um, as the scavengers are almost certainly going to attack, um, af- even after the Doctor's gave them a verbal warning, <laughs> yeah. um, the Doctor speaks to the to the planet, to the TARDIS, doesn't he? Um, and he says, this machine is very old, isn't it? And the voice replies, ancient as old as time. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a few other words. Um, the Doctor assumes that there might be names and places, and they're familiar to him somehow. I guess we'll find out in the upcoming stories. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I think, um, I mean, this was a this was an absolutely excellent episode, and it it does make you want to go right. Okay, this is the Legacy of Time is a story that I definitely want to listen to. I want to see, mm-hmm. you know, what happens, um, how the other characters are brought in, um, because at the very end of the episode we hear that the sirens have been released. Yeah, it's almost like the legacy of time is on the same level as the Marvel movies now because it's got like a post credit scene. <laughs> um, yeah. But yes, um, we're back with Rhea and she's probably in her final moments of death. 
and she's looking forward to tomorrow's adventure and then we hear a disturbingly familiar sound that we haven't heard in 20 years <laughs> it's the siren sound yeah which uh, i thought right okay that's i mean i mean i suppose it makes sense in terms of big finish because they're celebrating 20 years of of doing um doctor who adventures and so let's look at the very you know take it back to the very very first one that they did which was the sounds of time but um that was the, that was a surprise for me and a, quite a, quite a pleasant one i didn't actually expect that to, to happen whether it turns out it is the sirens as being the main villain behind everything it'll be interesting to see if that's the case or if the sirens are being are being used yeah, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't make sense that it follows on because the last we saw the sirens, they were in a conflict with the Temperon, mm-hmm. a big creature. Yes. Um, and also the the sirens say that the when the voice says the machine is destroyed, the sirens shall be free. Um, of course, they're referring to the TARDIS, aren't they? Mm-hmm. The planet TARDIS. Initially, I thought when thought maybe they were talking about Rhea <laughs> as the machine. <laughs> Ah, oh, right, okay, yeah. But a moment later, I kind of clicked and figured it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there's obviously a few steps in that narrative that we need to we need to listen to. Do you think that's a bit of a complex ending? Because you can be forgiven for even not understanding what's going on, even if you've listened to Sirens of Time before. Uh, I think it's a, it's a nice uh, teaser and a hint of what's going on. I don't think it's necessarily complicated. I suppose it is if you go, all oh, right, okay... And you start overthinking it before, just I think, just before you know, throwing throwing yourself into the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought it was a nice little hint of maybe where the story is going because uh, prior to listening to this, there was actually uh, there was a, a little teaser trailer with uh, Tom Baker in the TARDIS with uh, with Leela, and there's something weird happening with time and. The sixth Doctor, Colin Baker's uh, Doctor, seems to be impinging on it, uh, impinging on events a little bit. Um, so, so, so that sounded really interesting. Um, whether they do pair up Tom Baker's Doctor with Colin Baker's Doctor uh, remains to be seen or heard. But I, I would like that because I think of, I mean, apart from the actors sharing the same surname. Um, in terms of the characterization of those two doctors, there's very little that sort of links them, um, and sort of oh, I, I would really like to see how those how those doctors would would get along. They must all be in the same scene together at the end. Just for the listeners, um, we haven't actually listened to the following episodes yet. No, 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 not yet. We're just talking about the perspective of this story, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, there's some really cool dynamics that could be. That could be played off there with all the different Doctors. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, Tom Baker actually relating to the Fifth Doctor uh, <laughs> uh, would be quite good. There's a, there's a lot of... I mean, so obviously from, from our point of view, having just listened to the first episode, um, I think it's safe to say that we both really like it. That it was it was very well done. And it, it, it sort of... It's got us very excited listening to the rest of the story. Especially because mm. it's got the like of Simon Williams coming back to uh, back to play a uh, crew captain Gilmore. You've got uh, Katie Manning coming back as Joe uh, in one of the episodes. So th- there's a lot to be, get really excited about. Yeah. So with that in mind, and the fact that we've only listened to the first episode, um, what would you give it out of ten? Um, comparing it to the likes of The Light at the End, which was a similar release they did for the anniversary. Um, this yeah. story. It's kind of freed from the shackles of all the expectations, isn't it? In some respects, yeah. I, I, I never thought of it on that, but yeah, I think you're right. I think because uh, the light at the end is a, a big finish audio adventure, which I have listened to, which was released to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And I thought that was quite good, but yeah, I think um, basically the legacy of time gives them a bit more. Bit more flexibility. Flexibility. That's the word. It gives him a bit more flexibility because essentially all, all, all in a, inverted commas, but all what they're doing is celebrating twenty years of Big Finish, which is fantastic. Whereas, I think there is a lot more expectations with you know celebrating fifty years of Doctor Who, and that you have to have this absolutely mammoth story, and all the Doctors have got to meet and and so on. So there's a lot more expectations and a lot more restrictions on the writer. I mean, that was a good story. 
but I think in comparison to the, uh, I think the Legacy of Time feels a bit more. It doesn't feel restrained. Possibly. Yeah, it doesn't feel yeah. it doesn't feel so restrained. Um, because when you do the 50th anniversary story, obviously you can't please everyone, mm-hmm. and you have to, you'd like to meet expectations, so it has to give a good balance, perhaps. Yes. Of all the all the different doctors and everything you'd expect, and everything that perhaps um, respects what's been in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think although I do like uh, like the end, and I think they did a, an absolutely smashing job, even just this one episode. I prefer I prefer this episode. Yes. Um, I'd probably give it. I think I'll, at the moment I'll give it nine out of ten. Okay. And I think the only reason why I haven't given it full marks is simply because, and this isn't this isn't the fault of the writers. Uh, well, the the writer James Goss. That isn't. This is simply the, the fault of me not being so fully adverse. Or um, so fully aware of Big Finish audio, it's just I felt a little bit disconnected to the Eighth Doctor. But as we've you know we've already discussed, that's because I'm not aware fully of the the character development, so I wasn't fully connected to what was going on. But that's that's me, the fault of the listener, rather than that of the writer James Goss, who does a smashing job. I have a sneaking suspicion that what will happen is as I become much more familiar with. Big Finish uh, Doctor Who adventures. I'll probably come back to this and go. You know what? It's perfect. Everything, everything works. I connected it a bit more, and I'll probably give it ten out of ten at that point. Brilliant. Well, that's actually the same score I was going to give, and from a different perspective, I was going to give the same reasons as well. Oh, okay, that's um, interesting. Even though I relate to how different the Eighth Doctor is, mm-hmm. it is a, it is a, it is a monumental change, isn't it, in him, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, he doesn't relate to who he was, but yeah, of course, um, that's just a circumstance of his life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and as I said, you know, I'd much rather have, you know, drama where characters actually develop. I think it would be very weird after all this time that's passed that, yeah, you know, we have an Eighth Doctor who's exactly the same as he was back in two thousand, two thousand and one, or whatever. Yeah, like we're not the same people we were in nineteen ninety six. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if we were in like a Wild Bill Hickok costume. We wouldn't be wearing it now. Would have had a haircut. Yeah, I think it'd be a bit worrying if we were, <laughs> were exactly the same as we were back in nineteen ninety six. <laughs> wow, jeez. But yeah. So let's get to the listeners' responses. A couple of people have um, given their opinions on the story. On Twitter, Simon March said it has to be one of the best multi Doctor companion crossover stories in the history of Doctor Who. Even beats Day of the Doctor and the Five Doctors, in my opinion. Wow, that's really good praise. Yeah, um, and I can see where they're coming from. Yeah, I, I look forward to listening to the rest of the story, and I'll see if I actually agree with that. That's really good. Um, Ian got in contact with us on Facebook, and he said, "Excellent. Even though I did see some of the twists coming, it was super fun having Benny and River interacting. I definitely probably buy a Benny and River box set. Um, I agree with uh, with Ian on that one. It was it was indeed super fun, and yeah, I'm I'm certainly interested in listening to the." Um, the Benny adventure stories now. Yeah, I'm definitely feeling more inclined to now as well. Mm -hmm. Alex of the Doctor Who Target World podcast said, my feelings on the legacy of time is that it's excellent, it gets better and better, and I still think the first episode is the best one with Benny and River Song and the Eighth Doctor. And you can follow the Target World podcast on Twitter at WhoTarget. That's interesting that he thinks the first one's the best. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. And because, well, funny enough, we got uh, we got a response from a chap called John Porter, who who clearly has listened to the whole thing. And what he said was, thoroughly enjoyed it. Some cracking lines, probably the sacrifice of Joe Grant, um, which I think is the third episode. Anyway, sorry, he goes, probably the sacrifice of Joe Grant remains the favourite for me because there are some lovely moments of charm and some fabulous surprises in Collision Course. Plaudits to all for another big finish classic. So uh, John John Porter absolutely loves it. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to get stuck into the rest of this. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd like to give a big massive thank you to anyone who's responded. Um, we're very grateful and we're always happy to read out your responses. So if you get in touch again, that'd be great. Um, additionally, I'd like to thank anyone who responded to our recent Twitter cast telling us their favourite Big Finish story. 
because each Friday now we do a little spin-off show called The Twitter Cast, which is two minutes long, and we'll talk about anything really. I wonder, what, do you know what we're talking about next week, Liam? <laughs> <laughs> something spontaneous. Yeah, something spontaneous. Uh, we haven't quite planned it, but I do, I do quite like them, and they do seem to, um, you know, just two minute, uh, two minute short videos on on Twitter, uh, just talking about anything. So by all means, get in contact uh, if you would like us to have a, a quick reaction to something. That would be great. Um, just as a quick wrap up, uh, because the legacy of time is to celebrate twenty years of Doctor Who at Big Finish. Um, one, I, th- I think that's, that's absolutely fantastic that you know you got this uh, this company which is is doing absolutely tremendous work. It's gone on for twenty years. It's clearly going to go on for at least another twenty. It's tremendous, and they do a lot. I mean, it it, it began through a love of Doctor Who. And I'm I'm absolutely thoroughly enjoying uh, discovering that world. <laughs> it's took me took me a long time, um, but I'm loving going back and listening to these Doctor Who adventures. And the, the writing and the the acting is superb. And you've been you've been a fan, Rob, for for an awfully long time, haven't you? Yes, I've dipped in and out. Obviously, it's quite overwhelming the amount of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, initially, I thought I'd be collecting all the mon- monthly range um, inevitably that didn't happen <laughs> you know I kind of stopped eventually mm-hmm. after buying a few um, so I initially committed to just the 8th Doctor stories mm-hmm. because I thought that deserves a space on the shelf of all the DVDs um, but now that we're going back and reviewing all of the all of the monthly range again um, I feel like I want to explore more of the other Doctor stories a, a lot more yeah, yeah, I agree with that, and um, I and, and Big Finish have have broadened what they do. It's not just Doctor Who; they've done they do they've done a, original um, uh, audio adventures for one thing. One I would definitely love uh, to listen to, and I'm very tempted to get quite soon is Cicero, um, which is about the uh, the Roman politician and um, philosopher. Uh, and I think that was nominated for Best Audio Drama back in 2018. So that got a lot of lot of praise. And as you know, Rob, because we've talked about it recently, it had a bit of a laugh about it. I've gone on a massive Blake Seven splurge, a big finish, because I'm a big, big uh, I'm a big Blake Seven fan. I absolutely love that series, and I finally got round to buying Blake Seven Big Finish Audio Adventures. I've listened to the first of the classic adventure series, uh, which is stories fractures up to and including Cage, and they are phenomenally good. Uh, um, I find myself really enjoying them and getting tremendously excited for when I would listen to the next one. I absolutely, absolutely love that. So I'm going to listen to the second series at some point. And I've recently just bought a whole load of the um, the Liberator Chronicles, so I'm looking forward to listening to those. So, so yeah, I just had to mention that because I, I am really, really loving the Blake 7 stuff. What's kind of the sound and feel of those dramas? Does it, does it feel like it's a period piece like it's just like the episodes uh yes and no it's um f- so for that first series it's it's slot in uh it's it's six episodes and it's sort of the, the continuity it's it's it slots in um after voice from the past in series two and it um it feels it, it it doesn't feel jarring it does feel like it's it's a part of the series but at the same time it's 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 doing its own thing so it's its own little story arc which works works really well um Brian Croucher comes back and plays Travis and uh he was good in the TV series but I think in the audio adventures he's a lot better they do um they actually uh, they introduced the president of the federation who was mentioned in the series but we never saw him so he's actually brought in to these audio adventures so that uh which is tremendously interesting and there's a uh it builds up i don't want to give too much away um but obviously it builds up to an interaction between the president and blake which is really interesting and the president is a really i mean he's charming and all the rest of it but he's a really nasty piece of work and and it's just fantastic to to have the original cast come back and play those characters um and and you know, really for the last time, because unfortunately, you know, Gary, um, Paul Darrow passed away quite recently, uh, who played Avon, and Gareth Thomas, who played Roger Blake, died in 2016. Yeah. Um, but in terms of coming back to play those characters a lot, as long, uh, along with the other cast, they do an absolutely tremendous job. It's it's really sterling stuff. Um, 
So, yeah, as I said, I've listened to the first series of um, that they did of Blake 7, The Classic Adventures, and I've gone on a mad splurge of getting all the other stuff. And uh, I haven't bought all the Liberated Chronicles, but I've, I've bought a fair batch, and I should be getting those quite soon. But yes, I think we're very fortunate that we got the Blake 7 revival when we did. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite similar to Doctor Who on audio because it's got to the stage where there's so many stories they probably outnumber the TV stories. Oh, yes, yes, easily. Yeah. Um, and as I say, the um, I mean, they're, they're really prolific in in their output. and But not once has, has anyone been complacent about what they're doing because everyone, writers, sound designers, directors, the actors, everyone involved in doing these, clearly it's, it's a labour of love. I mean, their tagline is, we love stories. And that really shows. I mean, the, the writers, uh, they they do an absolutely fantastic uh, job. I mean, just going back to um, you know the, the Blake Seven stuff that I've listened to. You know, you got Justin Richards, you got Andrew Smith, Mark Platt, um, just to name a just to name a few, who've also written for the Big Finish Audio uh, Adventures as well. Yeah. Um, and what what they manage to do is as very talented writers is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Does it feel? Um episodic like the tv show or does it feel like it's gone off on a tangent well if you watch uh, series two of blake seven the whole over overarching arching theme is they they're trying to find the location for star one which is incredibly important but what they've done with these mini adventures is they've come up with their own mini story arc but um uh, and it's incredibly serious because um it appears that the Federation are developing their technology in a way that could threaten Blake and the crew. So they need to immediately deal with that. So the the fact that they go off on this sort of like this mini adventure to deal with that makes total sense. Whereas, so it fits in with the continuity of the TV series, but without without it being off putting where you're overwhelmed by the continuity. It sort of it slots in very nicely. Um, a story like Fractures which is really creepy and atmospheric and set totally on the Liberator, which starts starts it all off. Um, that can be very much enjoyed on its own. Whereas Battleground and Drones, they're two adventures which, which are linked. There are some fantastic cliffhangers. Um, I remember the way that Mirror and Cold Fury in particular ended. It was just, uh, particularly Cold Fury, the way that that story ended. So, right, I've got I've really because it was a later night when I was wanting to watch it. Uh, sorry, listen to it, um, and I, I really had to fight. It was like, no, I better get some sleep <laughs> uh, and look forward to listening to it the following day. I mean, I really got tremendously excited listening to them. Do but you to, think you'll find yourself revisiting them? Oh yeah, without a doubt, I'll I'll quite happily re-listen to them again. Do they have pretty place with the DVDs? Yes, they do. Yeah, I've got my. Uh, I'm developing my own little Blake Seven uh, shelf now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But uh, yeah, anyway, um, just as we were recording, uh, Paul Illett has just got in contact with us on Twitter about uh, the legacy of time, and he says, halfway through and loving it, really enjoying hearing new and classic Who characters interacting. Ah, that's interesting. So we are going to have a face off between old and new, mm-hmm. more than what we've heard already. So yeah, but, but I mean, just going back. So but going back to the legacy of time, even though we're just looking at that initial first episode, um, it's clearly sterling work and another triumph from Big Finish. Um, and looking forward to listening to the rest of it. Yeah, I think it's great that they're doing standalone stories mm-hmm. rather than five stories that jump back and forward between the Doctors. That's going to be completely jarring. So I think yeah, it's a really good approach. Mm-hmm. Well, if you've got this far, thank you for listening. Um, please feel free to check out any of our other podcasts. We've recently reviewed The Sirens of Time, Phantasmagoria, Whispers of Terror, and The Land of the Dead, which are the first four stories from Big Finish. That's right. Uh, our next main podcast will also be looking at the next story in the, in the series, which is The Fearmonger. Yeah, and we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and lots of other places. Go to cloisterbell.co.uk and check them out, and make sure to subscribe via email, and like us on Facebook and Twitter.